and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan, and today's guest in episode 29 is Eric Jensen. At the age of 15, he fronted up to the office of a Sydney street press and became a music critic and journalist, then received a job offer from the Sydney Morning Herald after finishing high school. Since then, he has written a biography of Australian artist Adam Cullen and became the founding editor of The Saturday Paper, a Schwartz Media publication which recently celebrated its second birthday. Now 27, Eric has seen the business of journalism change from up close, and the weekly newspaper he edits has become an integral part of the Australian media landscape. When he visited Brisbane in mid-June to host a panel at the Inspire Festival, Eric and I met for the first time at the hotel where he was staying. I have written a couple of stories for the Saturday paper, so this episode marks the first time I've interviewed a current editor of mine on penmanship. Our conversation touches on how Eric's apprenticeship as a news journalist began with sitting nearby fearsome reporters such as David Marr and Kate McClymont, how launching the Saturday paper drove him to the point of physical exhaustion in its first six months of existence, what happened when the producers of Australian Story attempted to film a television documentary about his life and how learning to write in shorthand helped him immensely when he sat down to write his book, Acute Misfortune, following four years of reporting. Introducing Eric Jensen, author and founding editor of The Saturday Paper. Welcome. Andrew, hi. I think you're the most mentioned guest so far on Penmanship, so it's good to finally sit down with you and have the microphone capturing your voice rather than other people talking about you. Is that, is that mostly complaints? Uh, people speak very highly of you, Eric. I'm sure it'll surprise you to hear that. It, it does. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here in Brisbane? I'm here to chair a panel for the Inspire Festival, which is on tomorrow, and um, I spent this morning and today in meetings with various people connected to the Saturday paper up here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We launched in Brisbane in print about a year ago, which is about a year sooner than we expected to, and so we're, hmm. um, we have a, a printing press somewhere outside Brisbane that, uh, that we come off each, each Saturday morning, and um, I suppose we're just filling in the, the other bits and pieces that come with needing to launch a paper in a new market, which is you know, talking to advertisers, talking to partners, mm-hmm. talking to writers, that sort of thing. Uh, what's the print run like up here in, in Brisbane? Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. I think the readership here in print is about 15,000. That's, I mean, how's that compared to Sydney and Melbourne? Uh, I think the readership in Sydney is probably something like 65 or 70,000 and about the same again in Melbourne. So mm. um, it's, it's a smaller market, but it's also one that we have, um, have launched into very softly. Yeah. Well, I was there from the beginning. I've been a subscriber since it Glad launched. Glad to hear it. It's a wonderful publication, and it's right now it's about just gone 4 p.m. on a Friday. Mm-hmm. If you weren't here in Brisbane, what would you be doing in terms of the production? I would be commissioning the first bits of next week's issue about now. Um, we have a production cycle that means we go to press very early on Friday morning um, because that's when there's... The, um, the most uh, cost-effective spare capacity on presses to be printing. Mm. Um, and that means that our sort of, uh, even though we're a Saturday paper, our cycle really begins on a Friday for the following week. So you close it on a Thursday afternoon slash night, depending yes. on how Dep- late copy arrives? Exactly, depending on um, how, how fiddly I'm being with headlines and um, how late the copy's been. We'll come to and how, how, how obsessively I've rewritten things. Right. We'll come to headlines later because uh, that's a topic of interest to me. But so, how do you go about commissioning? So, if usually on a Friday, you'd be looking at how do you look a week ahead to suggest what might be worth writing about by the end of next week? I wish I had a neat answer to that question, Andrew. Um, I think news news is about instincts, and certainly old newspaper people like to think that news is absolutely about instincts, and you you know you can't allow the audience to tell you too much, and it's it's about this kind of um, impulse hidden inside the body that you know that can't be explained and somewhat magical. Um, and while I don't necessarily believe that, I do think 
the architecture of news can be somewhat predictable. And if you look closely enough at news, you start to be able to predict where stories are going to end up and whether a story that's you know, started to break on a Wednesday is going to have any life in it next Saturday and whether in the mix that you're sort of looking towards or planning for the following week, a story is going to mean um, you know, you're overloaded with a, with a particular kind of feel in the paper, you're overloaded with a um, particular topic. And, and so it really, it's, it's not something that I put a lot of uh, explicit or conscious thought into, but I, I do start to have a feel for what I want in the paper on a Friday the week before. Um, and then there are obviously stories that get commissioned in the week of publication on the on the Tuesday sometimes, even sometimes on the Wednesday. Um, but really, I think where that, that comes from, the luxury, for me at least, of having this kind of apprenticeship in, in newspapers at the Sydney Morning Herald, where I started as a journalist, um, or as a news journalist, I should say, and um, where I had the luxury every morning of sitting down with my the senior writers who were sitting around me and spending the first hour or two of the morning complaining about that day's paper and how the news desk had it wrong and how the, you know, the, uh, the chief of staff had really fucked things up and the news editor had um, made terrible choices and the editor ultimately put the wrong stuff on page one. And while at the time that just seemed like the sort of um, white noise of complaint that you expect in newsrooms, what it really was on reflection was a, a kind of masterclass in understanding what made a good newspaper. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I think once, you, once you're once you at the point of reading the newspaper the day after it's been made, you're able to, even with that brief hindsight, have some insight into how that paper could have been better. And so for this, I don't know, however many years it was, for six or seven years that I was um, at the Herald sitting there having those, <laughs> those griping conversations, um, I was starting to understand at least what, what I thought good journalists wanted out of newspapers. And... Um, and to have those conversations without the pressure of actually putting one together. <laughs> mm-hmm. Your instincts seem pretty good for me as a reader. Like, rarely does it seem like you miss something or um, something that appears in the paper is old by the time it's a Saturday morning. How often do you think you get it wrong or you, you get the mix wrong? Uh, I, I beat myself up about the paper quite a lot and I think that's a, a healthy and sensible thing to do. <laughs> uh, it took me at least... I would say 10 issues before I had an issue that I thought was actually a good issue, mm. one that I, you know, that I was willing to be proud of. Mm. And you go through these runs, and this, this is the problem with um, newspapers. For a long time, I thought they could be perfect. That's why I launched a newspaper, because I'm idealistic, and I thought, oh, look, I like the newspaper I work for, but I think there could be a perfect newspaper. I'm uh, <laughs> egotistical enough at 23 to think that I would be the person who would make a perfect newspaper. It turns out that's crazy. Um, and the wonderful thing about newspapers is that they can never be perfect. This is why we make them sometimes. Every, well, you know, this is why a, a daily makes a newspaper every day because uh, the the magic of a newspaper is that it grows up and dies in a day quite often, mm. and that allows you a second chance. And a third chance and a, you know seven chances a week mm. um, for us we have one chance a week but uh, that still means that I can now accept that there will be things I don't like in a newspaper there'll be a story that came in and that wasn't as strong as I'd hoped and that I don't have anything to drop in in its place and no amount of rewriting sometimes can put the life into the story that isn't there mm. I mean some, sometimes you can take a story that you know is great but that is completely unreadable and you can spend a day sometimes two days uh, I think the, the most I spent on a story back and forth with the writer is about six weeks to get it to a point of publication and those times are very satisfying as an editor but um, the thing that has stopped me from going completely insane is, is realizing that there will just be bits of the paper that you have to forgive because the, the news itself is never good enough there's, <laughs> there's not necessarily enough things happening in a week to make a perfect paper or happening at the right time or mm. happening at the right time with the right people to talk to you or any of those other variables that, uh, that mean that you have to realise that um, this is the difference between news and fiction, fiction mm. you're in charge of. Just with that example of the six weeks, um, was that a commission piece or one that had been pitched to you? That was a commissioned piece, but it was a commissioned piece from a person who was not conventionally a writer. And I, I like to do that quite a lot. I think um, the Saturday paper is really a handful of experiments. Um, it's about testing assumptions that uh, that exist in newsrooms and, and assumptions that I felt when I was working in a big newsroom 
were um, were cumbersome um, and were uninterrogated. And I completely understand why in big newsrooms you can't interrogate assumptions because you don't have the time often and also you don't want to mess with an audience that is already somewhat fragile. Mm. Um, when, you, when you're a startup, you're allowed to do a whole lot of kind of punk radical things. You're, you're allowed to... Um, be make, ad- make mistakes. Agile and innovative. You can be agile other, and innovative. Oh, you, words of the day. you can just be wrong, yeah. uh, and and you know no one no one's there to tell you yet that that's uh, that, that is wrong. But in 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 among the assumptions I wanted to test were assumptions about who actually could write the news, and uh, I've made a big effort to get fiction writers writing nonfiction for us because one of the things I was worried about in newspapers is that despite narrative being the kind of the very fundamental building block of of language and storytelling La- narrative was something that seemed to um to disappear from news that news stories became a collection of facts one after the other and it didn't really matter um what linked those facts and the, the storytelling became incredibly arbitrary sometimes in news stories particularly in news stories that are being turned around very quickly and i understand the reasons for that i'm not uh i'm not dismissing that kind of of writing in newspapers and, and, and online, that kind of writing has a place. Um, but I really wanted to see if the news itself could, in addition to being important, also be pleasurable. And uh, one, of the, one of the ways to get to that is to, to get people for whom uh, the, the principal act for them is, is the actual writing itself, and, and to ask those people mm. to tell us the news. Who are you thinking of when you uh, say that? Maxine Benimba Clark, who uh, at the time that she began writing for us was a, was a poet and short story writer. I don't think she had done any nonfiction at that point. Writes nonfiction profiles for us. Portraits. Quite frequently portraits. Which so they are just incredible. Yeah, and that again, this was another assumption. I, I wanted uh, to, to find a means by which to interrogate the, uh, the conventional profile format in a newspaper and say, I don't want to know what film you've just made, where you grew up, or what your parents are like. Mm. I'd like you to be introduced to me like a small character on page 12 of a, of a novel who uh, might be sketched out in their key details, mm. an impression given of them, so they can leave those pages and maybe return later on. But in, in, you know, in, a, in a portrait, which is why they're all so short, if they're about a thousand words, the idea is that um, you might simply encounter a person and have some sketch of their details in that encounter but never make it feel like you're trying to tell me anything about the uh, the biography or the CV of that person because mm. the reason that sort of profile writing exists is largely because people don't get enough time with their subjects and as such they pad out the extra 1,500 words with other information we you know might know about Hugh Jackman. Mm. Um, and I don't know who that serves. It doesn't serve the reader, probably doesn't serve Hugh Jackman. Um, and I don't really think it serves the newspapers that carry those kind of pieces. And that's a real example, of course, Maxine Profile Portrait, wrote yeah. a portrait of Hugh Jackman maybe earlier this year. That's that's right. And again, that was about saying, if that was one of the very few times we've done an interview where we were given 15 minutes with someone, and quite deliberately it was a portrait of what it is to be given 15 minutes with someone. And I think it told you some more elemental things about Hugh Jackman and his experience of the of the reality he currently lives. Mm. Um, it would be terrible if every week a portrait told you what it was like to spend 15 minutes with someone. But uh, this is this is part of the mix. This is why sometimes we do celebrity portraits and sometimes we do celebrity profiles and other times we might write a portrait of um, someone who is quiet and ordinary and um, and in their, in their private moments extraordinary. And I, I, a portrait in particular that I think of there is a piece Kate Holden wrote for us. Kate Holden had written two memoirs when she started writing for us and had written some non-fiction, but this, I think, is the first time that she had started writing observed non-fiction um, or reported non-fiction, and she wrote a piece about a, a female paramedic that um, is completely electric. It was a really, really exciting piece of writing. I remember crying when I read it when it came in because it was just um, so visceral in what it had to say and it's the sort of writing that wouldn't necessarily have a place in a conventional newspaper because it wasn't news and nor was it lifestyle or nor, nor was it a cultural profile. It was just a bit of writing. But because you carved out that space for it, it had the perfect place to fit within your publication. Mm. Yeah. No, like, I'm thinking of that piece and I, I know what you mean about it being... Electric. So yeah, you've got a few few writers operating in that space. Maxine, Kate, 
Romy Ash, I think, does. Romy, Romy Ash does, uh, does really lovely portraits and profiles now for us as, as well. Um, and her her profiles read like longer portraits, which I think is... <laughs> I'm glad that that's the case. Mm. It's sort of... Um, I tried to find... You know, It's not like we're the first people ever to write impressionistic little glimpses of people, but I, I was hoping that we would kind of expand that language slightly in the paper and that it would you know, it begin to spill onto other pages. And I think that, that we've succeeded in doing that. So it was about finding an accessible bit of the paper for fiction authors to practice their nonfiction in and get them then to start writing in other parts of the paper. Seems to have been a resounding success. From my perspective as a reader, it's one of my favourite parts of the paper. Good. I'm glad to hear that. You wrote a portrait of sorts recently of your grandfather. Is that correct? Yes. This is... Uh, I I wish to say that as an editor I've never indulged myself, but um, and certainly you know I've never um, been frustrated at the parking out the front of my kid's school and and uh, got a story written about um, local governments um, or a taxi driver type example. Exa- exactly, but um, I don't know. I, I my my grandfather died on a Tuesday a couple of weeks ago, and I that night just wrote a, a kind of a brief portrait of uh, of the experience of his death at a distance, and I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. I hadn't I hadn't written any journalism for quite a while at that point, um, and then I showed it to my deputy editor, and she agreed that it was not simply indulgent to run it; that there was a, a purpose to running it. Um, mm-hmm. So it was I don't know it was a an enjoyable thing in a weird way to be able to pay tribute to someone who had been such a big encourager of my journalism um, and also a great lover of newspapers and to um, be able to, I suppose, um, even, <laughs> even though he's no longer around, find a way for him to, to be a part of the paper. Mm. No, it wasn't... Uh, I didn't find it self-indulgent at all. In fact, I was moved by it. I might have tear reading. It was really beautifully done. How did your family read that piece? Did you get much feedback from your family? Uh, they, they were all very happy. I realised also that it revealed some of uh, my own weirdness because it made clear that while I was on the phone to my grandmother learning that my grandfather was dying I was taking shorthand and Mm -hmm. I hadn't asked her permission to write the piece and I realized that I hadn't considered any of this because I am incredibly pro-disclosure and I rarely think about the subjects in my stories Mm -hmm. And um, that's probably on on one level quite weird and doubly weird when when your grandmother is the subject. Mm. Um, but they were they were all thankfully very happy with it. And it was only after I'd sent it to press that I realised that I had um, possibly crossed one or several ethical lines. Um, and certainly that Nan should know that when I'm talking to her, I'm probably taking shorthand. Even uh, in this case, not that I always take shorthand in conversations, but. Um, as a kind of almost uh, subconscious response to trauma, I just started taking notes. Hmm. Yeah, that was a great piece. I, I wish you would do more journalism, but perhaps uh, your current role doesn't permit the time it, spent. It, does, it, it fills in a fair bit of the day, I'll be honest with you, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, what's your daily routine like? If you could walk me through an average week in your life as editor of Saturday Paper, that'd be great. This, it's editing is a not terribly interesting thing, I think, ultimately. I, a lot of it is spent at my desk rewriting other people's copy. Uh, a fair amount of it is spent trying to think of stories that might be interesting, certainly during this election campaign. A huge amount of it is spent desperately willing stories into being because nothing is happening. Mm. Um, and you know, some of the pleasant parts of the day I spend encouraging good writers to hopefully write for me. Um, but there is, the, the, I, I presume there are editors out there in the world who spend their days at lunch having interesting conversations and um, you know massaging the egos of Christopher Hitchens. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is not my experience of being an editor in Australia, and I don't think it's um, the case for for any of the editors on any of our newspapers. There's just um, there's not enough space in the newsroom to have uh, dilettante relationships with the news. Mm. What kind of hours do you work? What time do you get to the office and when do you leave? It really it depends on the day. I usually would be at my desk by 9 and then I will be there 
anywhere between sort of eight in the evening and midnight or or one or two a.m. depending on where the day sits and um and just how behind I am. Just just how un uh, unyielding the news has been. Hmm. Is that the hours you had envisioned that the job would entail? I think so. I mean the. The hours in the first six months of the paper's life were much longer than that, and um, it was it was quite a um, a revelatory experience to launch a newspaper because I had, like most journalists, thought I was a cynic. Um, and I think in in newsrooms we traffic in cynicism because it's a kind of um, it's a shortcut to wisdom, or it's a kind of ersatz wisdom that we can um, pass off a world weary intelligence when in fact we're just taking the easiest response to things almost like a shield you can hold up and exactly deflect. exactly and particularly when you're when you're young in in newspapers i started at the sydney morning herald when i was 18 and everyone else was about 300 and so um it was it, I, I probably sort of projected a cynicism that i didn't have more aggressively than i might have otherwise anyway i'd, I'd, I'd properly believe myself to be a cynic at this point the, the other part of that is you know if um you sort of i i spent my whole time at the city morning herald sitting next to to david ma and he, that's sort of like a master class in cynicism um and it wasn't until i actually launched the newspaper that I realised what a um, terrible, terrible optimist I am, and how um, how willing I was to believe that all these things were possible without having really interrogated whether or not I could do it, whether or not it was possible, um, and whether anyone out there might care. And so the first the first six months were uh, a very steep learning curve and a very sleepless learning curve, and uh, I I did sort of actually physically collapse with exhaustion a few times just because. I was working as, as you know as much as I could without my eyes bleeding. Was that like face palming the keyboard or the desk or? Uh, no, like it was sort of you know uh, walking home and and collapsing is you know sort of uh, the word seizure sounds so um <laughs> so medical, but uh, being unwell. <laughs> Jeez, and also maybe not eating as well as you could and yeah. too much coffee and. Possibly. Like Look, I don't know. I I speak to my mother all the time, but not about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's backtrack. Where did your interest in words and writing come from? Because this podcast is all about people who work with right. words. Your grandfather uh, may have. My well, my 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 grandfather to some degree. I, I think I um, I got my love of argument from my grandfather. He was a he was a lawyer, um, and he'd been the privacy commissioner, and he's. Um, he had a kind of incredibly um, firm sense of of what was right. He he believed in a kind of social decency, a humanitarian decency that um, found him quite often out of step with the world. But my my love of uh, words, I think, probably came from my grandmother more. She had uh, had been a librarian, and uh, she filled my childhood with books, um, but it wasn't, I wasn't this a huge reader as a child necessarily, I really enjoyed talking as a child, and uh, I, I continue to enjoy talking, but writing is just something that I started to do one day really, and, um, and have been doing since, so I wasn't a child that wrote short stories or kept journals mm. or um, wrote for myself. I decided, I think quite arbitrarily when I was about 15, that I wanted to be a music critic. And I, I went to the offices of the local street press in Sydney, Drum Media, and uh, presented myself to the editor and told him that I would be his music critic. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realise just how ludicrous this seemed at the time. How were you received? Uh, well, he, he was somewhat taken aback, and he gave me a stack of CDs. Huh. And I, uh, I sent him, I think, the six reviews the you know the the following week or whenever my deadline was and then he just kept giving me music to review and then um about a year later i went to the sydney morning herald and uh pulled the same routine i went and saw bernard zoll told him he is the music editor there at the time he still is the music editor i told him i was going to be a music critic for him and again he sort of looked surprised and um asked to see some of my clips and then um gave me another stack of uh, CDs to review. And thankfully, I was able to get all of that out of my system quite quickly because I couldn't think of anything worse than being a music critic now. And and um, 
by the time I was finishing high school and trying to work out what I was going to do, I'd um, lost any enthusiasm I might have had for music criticism. Why? What, what uh, changed? Because you came into it quite idealistic. I love music, presumably. Yeah. I'm going to be a music critic. What changed between fronting up a drum and... Lis- listening to a lot of bad records and realising that... Uh, I don't believe that music criticism is like dancing about architecture, but there are limitations in 300 words to the interesting things you can say about a record. Especially if you don't like it. Especially if you don't like it. Um, And I suppose I also got bored of interviewing people who I didn't think were doing interesting things. Um, I spent a couple of really long interviews with bands and realised that I was talking to people who didn't think terribly much about what they did, who um, who happened, for you know, for any number of arbitrary reasons, to be in a position where they had an audience listening to their music, and uh, and while I might have liked the music, that didn't mean that the person was interesting, hmm. and I you at the same saw, time you saw too much. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I, I I think you know this that makes me sound like a very condescending eighteen-year-old. I probably was, um, <laughs> but at, at the same time, I was I was finishing up school. I wasn't at all confident that I was going to get into a university degree um, and really? so I got, a, I got a call from the then editor at the Sydney Morning Herald, a man called Alan Oakley, asking if I'd be interested to come in and talk to him about joining the staff as a as a news writer because he had decided that he had had enough of um, law and economics graduates filling up his newsroom and uh, he would like to experiment uh, with taking on someone whose only expertise would be no expertise at all. Mm. Um, There's a theme of experimentation running through your career, I see. Yeah, and that's, that seemed like a great idea, and it also meant I didn't have to um, fretfully wait to see what my UAI was. Hmm. And so I, I went blundering into to news journalism. How was it received uh, in the playground, the fact that you were a 15-year-old music critic getting free CDs and all that sort of thing? Okay. Again, like editing, being a mu- music reviewer is not terribly glamorous. But did others perceive it that way? Uh, not, not really. What the, un- the problem was that at almost the same time uh, a film Almost Famous had come out, and so any time I was backstage at a gig, I would have to listen to uh, 12 different versions of the same Almost Famous joke, mm. uh, which again didn't confirm in me any enthusiasm for the deep thinking of musicians. Which is a weird thing to say, because on re- <laughs> while, while I, I sound as if I... Um, I stopped liking music. That's certainly not the case. Mm-hmm. I, I turned around the other day and realised that the bulk of my friends are musicians. They're just not the ones I was interviewing when I was 18. <laughs> uh, including one friend whose record I panned uh, ferociously when I was 15, who doesn't know that, um, uh, that I had done that, and uh, who, in our friendship, I'm, I'm wait- I feel like we've been friends long enough now for for them to find out but um feel free uh, to break no i don't know if i want to break break i I don't know if i want to sort of break break that news here but um (laughs) uh you know it's it's sort of like a a shame i was carrying around with me in the first few years of our friendship that i feel now if 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 discovered um i've done enough to repair that damage but it also and it tells you and and it's a record i actually quite like now it tells you it tells you something of why you shouldn't necessarily allow uh teenagers to work as music critics what was it like? I think everything that I that I had to say about that record was right. Hmm. It's just that in uh, in dismissing all those things that were wrong, I missed what was good. Oh. That's quite a mature perspective to have now. As a how old are you? I'm 27. Yeah, right. So yeah, you've come a long way here. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. What was it like seeing your byline in print for the first time in drum? I presume. Yeah, drum media. I think I think it was. It was quite exciting. I've, I've, I've always loved seeing seeing anything in print, um, and it was it was a, a thrill to see my name in print. I think for the first time, certainly, you know, it was a, a thrill the first time your name's on the cover of a magazine. It's a, it's a thrill the first time you get a, a splash for a, for a newspaper. It's it's a thrill the first time you see that little red exclusive mark above your byline in the newspaper. Mm. Um, less of a thrill to see your name very, very small on the inside of page two in a newspaper, describing you as the editor. Mm-hmm. But uh, edi- editing is about, I think, divorcing yourself from the ego of being a writer. Mm. And I feel like I've been edited by people who are good writers, who are terrible editors, who um, 
who are vicious with their editing out of a kind of jealousy that all writers have for each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope that I'm sufficiently self-aware to not do that to other people. Where did you get the self-confidence to walk into drum media and then Sydney Morning Herald and say, essentially, give me a job? Or I'm the guy that you're going to employ for this role yeah. that already exists and has been you know, chased by dozens or hundreds of young people before me. The, the great thing about uh, journalism is it allows you to ask questions of other people and never of yourself. And so these are, these are the sort of questions to which I don't have answers. I presume my confidence as a child came from the fact that I was raised, I feel, as if I was always an adult, at least the adults in my life always spoke to me as if what I was telling them was interesting or um, what I was thinking was somehow uh, unique or revelatory or, or, you know, worth worth listening to. Mm. Um, And so I think that that confidence came from the fact that I felt as a child like more of my friends were adults than were than were people my own age. Um, certainly, as a as a young child, I always drew myself bigger than my family. Uh, that's I think that's just the the, the delusion of youth. Um, yeah, yeah. And I realised this a little while ago. I was being followed around for Australian Story, and they ultimately decided that I was too boring <laughs> to be a subject of Australian Story, which is really Cuts it's twelve hours of yeah. sitting at the desk scrolling <laughs> through words. It's it's a confronting thing to be told by a producer. Like, yeah, we've been filming you for about twenty hours now. And there's actually nothing there. Mm. You're, <laughs> you are incredibly boring. But I've I've dealt with that news and I've I've made peace with it. But uh, in one of these long interviews, and I, I've also the reason people cry on Australian Story is not because um, it's really tender documentary making. It's not because these people um, are confronting great trauma or great tragedy. The reason people cry on Australian Story is that some of those interviews go for like eight hours. It's like a waterboarding. They weigh you down. Um, and by the end, you know, you'll you'll just <laughs> you'll be talking about what you had for breakfast, and you'll burst into tears and and, and want to give them, the, you know, the, the nuclear codes because it's it's like Guantanamo Bay. Uh, it's like the, a black side. The ejector button. Just, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I was doing one of these long interviews. I was being asked about my grandmother, um, and something that I had never thought about in my childhood again because journalists, uh, by nature, thankfully, never interrogate themselves, but. Uh, I realised my grandmother had set up this pretend school during the school holidays, uh, which she would would call Nan School, and would be um, a a, a sort of quite disciplined punctuation school. Mm. Um, And there were a lot of exercises. There was a lot of disappointment from Nan at um, the inadequacy of of my sentence structure and and various things that she was unhappy about at Nan School. But I realised as I was telling the story to Australian Story that... uh, Nan had, Nan had made up an entire pretend school so I wouldn't notice that I didn't have friends during the holidays. Oh, wow. And I realised that that's the most pathetic thing I've ever heard. That's a desperately sad story. Sad for me. But also um, I realised that what a kind of generous and beautiful thing for someone to do for their grandchild. Wow. Um, and every time I'm viciously re-editing a piece, I can know that I am being nothing like as vicious as my grandmother and also just as caring and tender, that the sentence is ultimately who I am there for. Wow. Um, so this is, this is the one, <laughs> it's a roundabout way of saying, I think where the deluded self-confidence of youth uh, came from for me was uh, adults who had allowed me to pretend I wasn't young. <laughs> you have siblings? I do. Everyone thinks I'm an only child, which I think is them saying that they think I'm an asshole. But I have a, a lovely older sister. What does she do? She's a teacher. Mm-hmm. High school? She's a high school teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, she is a very dear friend of mine, obviously being my sister, but she's also entirely unlike me in every respect. She's, um, she's organized and orderly and, uh, and respectful and um, uh, decent. And you know, all, all she's she's like she, uh, people refer to her as the good Jensen, uh, and I'm not I'm not unhappy about that. Implying that you are the bad Jensen. Well, that would seem to be the dichotomy that's being established. Yeah. yeah. Right. What kind of writers were you obsessed with as a young teenager, heading into going to 15 and being fronting up at the drum media? Mm-hmm. Like, who did you admire? Uh, yeah, all of the cliches of you know um, Nick Kent, Lester Bangs, um, a little bit of Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, thankfully, I kind of tumbled out of music 
journalism and reading music journalism quickly enough to get more into the new journalism of the 60s and, and to really start getting into people like Gator Lees, um, to get into someone like uh, Joseph Mitchell, who I think still is the really defining influence on my um, my style as a writer and my impulses as a storyteller. Um, and thankfully, I came to you know, to Mitchell late enough that it wasn't completely crippling to read him. Mm. Um, that you know that I at least made enough marks on paper to um, to not then be hit by a, a shadow as great as his. And then thankfully, I had those uh, those intoxicating books of his uh, long enough before then reading the biographies that make clear that um, you know a lot of those stories are invented mm. a lot of his journalism is very very substandard we would uh scandalously so we would um probably sack him if i mean certainly the, the new york the new yorker would not be able to keep him on as a writer mm. but the kind of invention in his pieces sometimes the subjects of his pieces were entirely invented mm. or um they were collages of several people rolled into one but there was no there was no attempt in the piece to make clear that this is what, what was happening certainly um the quotation, which is such a key part of his journalism, was often invented or um, augmented or uh, you know, modified in a way that I wouldn't deem to be acceptable. Mm. Um, and had I known that when I first started reading him, I wouldn't have had the magic and I, um, I wouldn't have wanted desperately to be able to do what I saw him doing because I would have known that, um, that it wasn't possible. But I think I think some of what he did is possible to do and certainly his great gift to journalism was his listening or at least what looked like his listening maybe he made the quotes up now but he um he allowed ordinary people to speak and he allowed them to speak with a great dignity of length and um that was that was the sort of stuff that was in my head when I started working on that Adam Cullen book Mm. was that I um that I wanted to be small in this story and that I wanted to allow someone to speak and I wanted their voice to be there on every page and that meant I wanted my shorthand to be faster than their hesitations I wanted to get down every every little uncertainty and and doubling back of every sentence um, and happily Adam Cullen as a subject was a man who spoke in quite perfect sentences mm-hmm. but uh, it was in that book, this was this was still. I wrote that book before I discovered the fraud of Joseph Mitchell. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was I was reaching for that. Mm-hmm. How did you and Adam Cullen cross paths? Uh, I wrote a profile of him at the Sydney Morning Herald, and got a call from him a couple of weeks later, telling me that he had a, a book contract and that he wanted. This seemed completely credible to a nineteen-year-old that he wanted me to come and live in his spare room on and off and, and write his biography and Thames and Hudson would publish it. And that, uh, I, I, I didn't even question for a moment that a major publisher might have reservations about a child um, endeavouring to write a biography for them and worse still, the, the subject of that biography choosing them. Um, because, as I say, I, I pretend I'm cynical, but I'm not. Mm. Um, and and so I, I started work on this book. It, it became clear that I was I was participating in another man's fiction, mm. and that this book was about trying to understand what was true and what was not. Um, and I would probably not start a project like that ever again. But at the time, it seemed, even at its most frustrating, its most violent and exhausting, um, I was heartened by the fact, and this is still before I realised that Mitchell was a fraud. Not a fraud, fraud is unfair, but before I realised Mitchell was practising something we wouldn't now recognise as journalism. Um, I remember being deeply frustrated, thinking about Joseph Mitchell and thinking that I would keep working on this book because if I were to sit down and invent a fiction, if I were to invent a character, he wouldn't be as large or as interesting as Adam was. Hmm. And you know, even though I knew that meant that lots of what Adam had to say was not true, I was fascinated by what he was saying, and um, I haven't really thought about this in this context before. But what I what I was encountering was someone who was doing what Mitchell did to his subjects, but doing it to himself. Mm. You must have got on reasonably well when you did that first profile of him. He must have liked you or what you wrote. I think so. I, I mean, 
being a young journalist is always about trying to project kind of you know talent and authority you probably don't have and so I, I was probably doing doing that double time that particular day mm-hmm. um, I went back when I was writing the book and read the profile and uh, um, I'm not unhappy that it's difficult to find online <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll find it put in the show notes I don't know, maybe maybe not we'll see uh, how did that unfold for you? So you began working on the book in tandem with what you're doing at the Herald? Mm. Yeah, so I... Even though the book contract did not exist it didn't at that exist. time? No. Um, I was working on that with long interviews. The, the, the thing about journalism at the time that I joined a newspaper, you still were given two months leave a year, mm. and you were um, compelled to take it because there was such concern that in the, um, on the sort of papers accounts there'd be these huge uh sort of um you know leave leave bills that Mm -hmm. um, that would have to be paid out there'd be these um liabilities there so i would spend big blocks of time interviewing adam um i'd spend my weekends at his place interviewing him and i was doing this quite aimlessly um I, i i didn't really know what i was doing with the book for a long time and i was just taking notes and um the only thing that makes that book even vaguely credible is the fact that um, it's in all the time I didn't know what I was doing I was filling up notepads with shorthand and when I sat down after he died to write it um, I was able to sort of beat shape into what had been a very shapeless four years Um, but in the course of doing that find that there was a kind of um, irresistible inevitability to what had been happening those whole, whole four years hmm. and um, and to realize also that in in not having had great discipline in the time of of those interviews and not having had great discipline while he was alive um, that I then forbade the introduction of anything that I didn't have and so it, it made it made it a, um, a more fragmented and I would argue more interesting picture of a person than if I had have known what I was doing. And this is, I mean, I've, I've never trained at anything. And so I, um, I am a great believer in, um, in the kind of, sub- <laughs> the, the unexpected magic of, uh, of not knowing. <laughs> right. Where did you learn shorthand? At the Sydney Morning Herald, when I started there, one of the only things that you had to uh, prove in your cadet year was that you could write 120 words a minute in shorthand. And I think I was probably one of the last cohorts of cadets to um, to do that with a with a shorthand teacher called Penny Schofield, who was uh, incredibly fearsome and incredibly brilliant, and taught shorthand to two or three generations worth of journalists. Mm. There were there were people in their fifties in that newsroom who had learnt shorthand at her knee. Mm. Uh, she was also incredibly eccentric, and um, I think I, I think I was the only person in my year who didn't um, who didn't cry in her class because she she would she would abuse people. Um, she took kind of uh, I will say maybe an almost an almost unhappy pleasure in abusing people. But um, she was also this store of you know. Um, decades of stories about journalists and about journalism and um, she was sort of both terrifying and a confidant to cadets she mm. would um, you know if, if you were having a rough time on a particular round or um, particular part of the paper she would she would invariably have some story about someone much better and much more experienced than you being even worse at it <laughs> <laughs> would you use shorthand in tandem with the recorder like the one on the desk between us or would the shorthand is meant to just be the record of yeah. what happened, and that's it. Shorthand is is the record, um, and it has it has all sorts of benefits. One is that uh, you don't have to go and transcribe anything, and the time saving of having four years, what would have been four years worth of tapes, if that's what I ended up with after interviewing Adam, I would never have written that book. Right. Um, thank God I had, you know, a couple of crates of of notepads, mm. which. I could skim through more or less nowhere I was going to get to in a conversation. I could find things, mm. um, even though they were sort of chaotic in their own way. Mm. But in terms of actually interviewing people, what I love about shorthand is the way in which it builds an almost immediate intimacy. Firstly, people are disarmed by it because they don't see it very often. Mm. But then 
where people get nervous around recorders, and I, I don't know if this is if this is Nixon and Watergate or what it is, but people people recoil a little bit when they see a recorder um, the red light. because yeah, the, yeah they they feel that somehow you're going to trap them and they're mm-hmm. going to be caught out. When you take shorthand, you are firstly you're, you're involved in a kind of physical act with someone and you're negotiating a truth with them almost. They're mm-hmm. talking to you and you're putting their truth down onto the page and they don't feel like they're going to be trapped. They feel like um, they feel like they're notating with you that they're that, that this is dictation and they're telling mm-hmm. you something that they're not they're not being caught out they're sharing mm. um and i've i've always enjoyed using shorthand as a means by which to be closer to a subject um certainly on a death knock i think shorthand shows a kind of respect um an unexpected and old fashioned respect that people these are people often on death knocks who have had no experience of the media who um who don't know what they expect from a journalist but who when you pull out a notepad suddenly understand that this is part of some old tradition and mm. they are, that they are part of an established process of things here and that, again, you haven't come into their house and wired it up and started capturing them. Mm. What you've done is come in and asked if you could take down some of their thoughts. Death Knocks have come up a few times on the podcast. Um, what rounds were you working to do that and how would you generally introduce yourself? Uh, so I was always a general reporter even though I did some investigations at the Herald and covered I suppose occasionally specific beats um, because I have no expertise being a generalist has always always suited me and so you know the death knocks I would do would just come up in the course of you know something terrible happening and the chief of staff needing to send someone to go and speak to the person to whom something terrible happened Uh, I don't think too consciously about my te- my technique in that setting I, I sometimes think um, really aggressively about my technique as a as a journalist and as an interviewer I um, I sat at the Herald next to some people who were very very good in very different ways at at, at interviewing people at asking questions um, Kate McClymont is an incredible interviewer and I look this this sounds facetious but having watched her intently as she did some of some of the interviews that you know became the undoing of Eddie Obeid or, or that became big stories for her I, I think one of her great skills is to somehow express through a telephone the snoopiness of her face the fact that as a story got better her eyebrows would lift higher and her hair would become uh, more nesty and uh, and that on the other end of the phone a person simply doesn't want to disappoint someone who is so snoopy mm. and that they would continue just to tell her things. And uh, Kate, Kate's brilliance is that she would... Uh, if she's someone who calls you, you know that your day's going terribly. And uh, you know you should never be in a situation where you're speaking to Kate McClymont. And yet the very people who she might be writing about you know, in the, in the most uh, unhappy ways on page one of the Herald are the very same people who might talk to her again a week later. It's, mm. it's an incredible talent she has. It's because you sense from her this this kind of um, important gossip, and you want to share in it as a subject, and you and you want to be part of Kate McClymont at the same time as you know that it's just going to work out very badly for you if you do. But watching watching her, there's there's just uh, that's that's a whole personality thing. That's you can't project that. You can, you can watch other people who who work at interviews, and you can see the intelligence of of their of their interviewing style, and you can get a sense of what they're doing and how they're arranging their interview and, and where they're inserting questions that would otherwise be too much up front or, or, or too dismissive later on and, and, and how they structure an interview to hit different points. And I used to think very critically about how I would, would do that. But, mm. but at Death Knocks, um, I, I would only project what I had, which, which was youth. And, and very often Death Knocks, unfortunately, involve the death of the young it's, it's inevitable. And I, I remember doing a couple of death knocks where I would be taken inside and I would feel very strongly like this mother was seeing the first young person she'd seen since her son had died. Mm. He may have died a few hours ago. And that, um, that in that immediate grief, I think I was offering um, her the capacity to remember her son in a way that she wanted to in, in print. But also in person, she was 
she was seeing some cipher for a generation she was now cut off from because she mm. didn't have a child anymore. Wow. In that situation, you're there to be objective, to take the record and um, put some context around this person's death. It's meant to be a very objective, you know, just the facts, ma'am, sort of thing. But mm. were you, any situations where you felt yourself become emotional based on what they were saying, or oh, of course, and I, I think as a journalist, um, <clears throat> there is no there is no shame in sharing emotion with your subject. Mm. Um, certainly, in that Alan Cullen book, I became entwined in an incredibly claustrophobic and at times terrifying relationship uh, that was not of my making at all, but that. Um, became very necessary to the project, and that you know a big part of that was about being interested in in this notion of immersive journalism and seeing what that might functionally mean, mm. and being thrilled to find a subject who wanted to participate in something that was as immersive as that. Um, but I, I mean, I want my news to be objective. I don't think that means I want my journalism to be objective. I um. I am willing to to see a journalist in a story. I'm willing to see a journalist um, engaging with a subject in a way that crosses standard journalistic lines um, because if it's true, it's still good storytelling. Um, and I don't, I don't mind necessarily the forms in which that storytelling takes. And if that means a loss of objectivity sometimes... And as long as the reader is clear on what is happening, mm. then I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I mean, one of the examples that used to be thrown around at the Sydney Morning Herald was, was Malcolm Brown's coverage of the Lindy Chamberlain story. He became um, an incredible defender of hers in the first trial. He became very close to the family. And when finally she was acquitted, Malcolm was the only person in the country with that story mm. because of his dedication to what turned out to be the truth but in the first trial looked like uh, looked like it wasn't or at least looked to a jury like it wasn't hmm. um, and that tells you something about I suppose the times at which journalists are allowed to um, involve themselves personally in a story and also cut against the conventional wisdom on a story What kept you going back to see Adam? I don't know the answer to that question, um, because you know it was it was exhausting and it was violent. He he shot me, and he threw me off a motorcycle, and you know there were, there were a handful of things which I would not now accept in life. Um, right, good to hear. But I, you know, I I felt like what I was doing was interesting, and I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what he meant. I, I couldn't understand him. Um, and then on a very basic level, I told a whole lot of people I was writing a book and it was too embarrassing not to. And so even once it became clear to me that there was no book contract, I was too proud to tell other people that that was the case. Um, and I stubbornly knew I had to, I had to do it um, simply to make sure I wasn't a liar. Did you tell anyone you didn't have a book contract? No. Like not even your sister or your no. grandmother? No. Wow. That's, uh, that's interesting. And this is, this is the problem, I suppose, with objectivity and, and what happens when you shed it, is that um, the worst thing you can do in journalism is find yourself trapped by someone else's lie. Mm. Um, and this is a kind of Joseph Mitchell lesson. The difficulty and the brilliance of his his best two profiles, Joe Gould's Secret, um, which began as a profile called Professor Seagull, and then 30 years later was another profile called Joe Gould's Secret, and they're collected as a book now. And it's the story of a man who claimed he was writing an oral history of the world, a book 14 times longer than the Bible, who, who was an eccentric in the East Village uh, and was carrying around, you know, um, in, the, in the 40s, carrying around sort of briefcases full of clippings and, and what was meant to be this book and, and Mitchell wrote this wonderful profile about this man who claimed he could speak to seagulls who claimed he was writing this oral history of the world he wrote this quite credulously as well and um, and Gould spoke at length in it and it was it was that magic I was talking about of, of hearing a voice you'd never heard before and hearing it true mm. um, and 30 years later or so he wrote the same profile again for the New Yorker uh, 
sketching out those early details and then closer and closer slowly getting to the fact that this book didn't exist hmm. that that Mitchell had participated in a lie that had offered this man fame and fed his vanity and his badness and um, his excess in those intervening years and that now was the time to say you know I, I was I was wrong hmm. I was lied to and I took that lie because I wanted it to be true um, it takes a lot in in journalism to to confess that mm. but uh but it's necessary to confess it and it's and and this is this is why it's easier just to be objective because if you never get really close to a story mm. you're never likely to find yourself accidentally lying for someone um and i'm, I'm not suggesting this happens often in journalism and it, and it probably only really really happens in profile journalism um but it can happen that you're on the wrong side of a story as the story is breaking and that you need to start writing the other side of that story. Mm. And it is a good journalist who is willing to do that. And all journalists should be willing to do that. So what was the timeline? You spent about four years with Adam. Mm. He died. What was the timeline there between him dying, you starting to write the book, getting the book contract and publication? Uh, I think the book came out about 18 months after Adam died. Um, I was launching the paper at that time as well, so I'd, I was um, I was a little bit busy, um, but I I wrote I wrote the book very quickly, and uh, a publisher was interested in it before I'd started writing it, and um, then I you know sent it off to the publisher and it became a book. And it was um, I'm, I'm, there are people who spend lots of time writing books um, and for whom this is a very irritating story, and I can confess that it's an irritating story, but um, happily. It was it was quite easy. Published by Black Ink. Yeah, so, th th so that's th that's the other. You know, they're on the other side of the office from me, so it was easy enough to walk over and say, "Hey, I've got a manuscript. Are you interested in it?" Yeah. So somewhere around here, you meet Maury Schwartz, mm -hmm. and as far as I can tell, that's a turning point in your life so far. Can you talk a bit about that first meeting and why it happened. Sure. Uh, I had become increasingly frustrated at some of those assumptions I was talking about that are made in newsrooms and not tested. And I sent a kind of grandiose email to Maury Schwartz, and didn't think much of it. Who at that time was who at the time was the publisher of the monthly, the quarterly essay, and uh, and Black Ink books. And um, he came up to Sydney to meet me, and we we met for lunch, I think, um, just beside Luna Park in Sydney, and we spoke nonstop for six hours. We weren't drinking. I um, I drank. I drank a. I think I just I I drank a few coffees. He drank a peppermint tea. It was quite a respectable lunch in that respect. Mm. Um, what, but what, by the end, what was your preparation for that meeting? Did you go in with like taking notes? Like this is what I want to cover off. No, I had no preparation. Like okay. like most things, I just went bumbling in. <laughs> um, but we 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 enjoyed each other's thinking very quickly. And uh, we'd agreed by the end of the meeting that we wanted to work together and that we were both thinking around this idea of how newspapers could operate in a world that said they couldn't. And I started working for Maury and, well, the, 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 the name of the paper was registered maybe even by the end of that meeting. Um, and then I, I started working on what that paper would actually look like how we would print it, where it would be distributed. Um, this was like 2013? This is, yeah, it was 23 when we yeah, started yeah. working on that. Um, and happily, just had 18 months of testing this idea and and um, going through designers and being very uptight about key lines and um, all of the very lovely things that there just wouldn't be time for once you launch the paper. You know, touching paper stock. <laughs> Yeah, inspecting presses. I think uh, in the press or somewhere, maybe in your Twitter bio or something at the time, you were like your title was uh, like special projects or something, director of special projects within Schwartz Media or something like that. Does that sound familiar? To yeah. You? So this is the other thing is um, we both agreed for reasons unclear to me now that it was important we keep this secret, <laughs> um, and I can't, I can't really ascertain why that was because it was not like someone else was going to come sweeping past us and also launch a newspaper there was the conventional wisdom that was uh that this was a, not going to be a sensible thing to do um and happily 
it's the the paper has uh, either made money or broken even every issue since launch. Wow! And it's it's really working as a, as a model. As um, there is a viable way to treat people seriously, and uh, and find an audience that enjoys being treated that way and is willing to pay to be treated that way. Mm. Um, and so. Uh, there's a handful of reasons for that, but basically each each assumption, each fundamental assumption we wanted to test around what a newspaper could be um, turned out to be an assumption that we came down on what I think is the right side of. Hmm. So you resigned from the Sydney Morning Herald. I did. How did you resign? Uh, I went into the editor's office and told her I was leaving, and she said, oh, a lot of people will be upset that I didn't try to keep you, which was, you know... That was nice of her to say, I suppose. Um, and, but you know, while while I know that I'm a person who is incredibly lucky, of course, I resigned two weeks before a redundancy round. I should have known at Fairfax that one was just around the corner. Um, but happily, I resigned to do something that I really enjoy doing. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, it was it was not more complex than that. I, I moved to Melbourne the following week. I moved into East Melbourne, which I'm still living in, which is such a weird suburb, but on a map looks quite close to things. You don't really, you can't tell on a map just how many retired paediatric surgeons are in one place. It's not, it's not clear in a, in a Melways. Um, and I didn't, I didn't tell my parents what I was doing either because of this uh, secrecy that I was sworn to. <laughs> so uh, for, for 18 months, my mother um, had no idea what I was doing. Like except, most of the world, right? Yeah. So you and Maury. Yeah. So I was, it was nice. The Australian used to call it Project X, which made it sound a lot sexier than, than perhaps it really was. Did you negotiate more money, significantly more money than you were getting at the Herald? Um, look, I think if I'd gone to Shine Shoes, I would have made more money than I was making at the Herald. So <laughs> this, uh, this, is, yes. this is one of the things about uh, being employed for your naivety alone. <laughs> um, if you're a very young person who joins a newsroom and you have no degree, no prospects, um, you don't get paid very much. But that's not a complaint. No one in media gets paid what they're what they're worth. The reason they're in media is because what we do is important and we enjoy doing it. Hmm. Somewhere in there, you wrote a cover story for the monthly profiling Kevin Rudd. Yes. When was that, Rudd? He was prime minister at the time. He, yeah, uh, I think. No, Gillard was prime minister. Um, it was a. I think the piece was called something like Rudd's Dirty War. It was like the saboteur. The saboteur. That's right. Front. Yeah. Uh, this was this was just after the bizarre sort of um, uh, phony challenge that was Simon Crean imploding. Um, the sort of you know, if you're going to be a suicide bomber, you're meant to talk to the other guys about doing it first. Um, so it was it was looking at, I suppose, the um, the running campaign Rudd had to return himself to the leadership, and looking also at the way in which the media had been um, used in that and, and, and been quite complicit. Um, not that I don't think a challenge was imminent and not that I think it's irresponsible to report a person's desire to challenge, but, um, and not that it's irresponsible to report a leak that reveals something about the government. I think it's, you know, it's, it's vital to report that stuff. Um, but you, you get into an uncomfortable position when, when you're reporting leadership challenges that um, that every bit of material you get has an ulterior motive, mm. and uh, you have to start deciding whether or not um, the ulterior motive is uh, worth more or less than the than the story that you're actually telling. I seem to recall that article of yours being uh, quite contrarian at the time, and you were later vindicated though, because I think what you wrote was true. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I don't. I didn't think that that view was contrary at the time, um, but I had never really been seduced by the by Kevin Rudd, even in two thousand and seven, when I was um, briefly down in Canberra for the Sydney Morning Herald. I remember re- uh, meeting Kevin Rudd uh, as opposition leader and uh, being truly terrified, and wondering why it was that everyone was so excited by a man who. In every moment, you could see the three steps it took him to ask himself what was normal, what a ho- what a person would do, and what what he would do next. Um, there's the the sociopathic tendencies of Kevin Rudd were so obvious even then that it was 
surprising to me that um, that we weren't writing about them. Um, and it, I, you know, I wasn't I wasn't writing political profiles at that time. It wasn't my place uh, to be writing that story. Um, but it came as such a surprise to the country when when they found out what everyone else had for a long time known. Mm. And it's um, that's a flaw in the Labour Party as well. It's a flaw in, in media management, in politics. It's a flaw in the way in which we cover politics, that um, you know, it is not, it's not a useful thing if you're a political reporter to tell us that, uh, that one half of your entire business, that is the opposition, is led by a madman, um, because that's, that's not going to produce for you um, any particularly useful relationships in the opposition. And, um, you know, this is, this is a problem in all, in all fields of journalism that, you know, wherever you have contacts, you'll find yourself doing, doing some work that is maybe not ideal to maintain those contacts. Ignoring stories in some instances, um, you know, narrowing stories in others. Mm. Um, but in politics, this is especially true because um, it's it's played so aggressively in terms of how the media is managed as well. And um, it's so difficult to get information in politics that you can't really afford to start saying the leader of the opposition is a lunatic, mm. um, particularly when it's very likely he's going to become the prime minister. Mm. And um, I don't know what the solution to that is. Uh, sometimes it means sending um, you know, someone from one of your other bureaus to go down and write that profile, mm. but they're not going to have the backstory that that a political reporter has. They're not going to have the access to other sources that a political story, uh, reporter has and um, and they can still screw it up for the outlet. And by screw it up, I mean allow themselves to be victim by a system, well, be victim of a system um, where where you can simply refuse access. Where, where you know, we've we seen this last week with, with Trump refusing the Washington Post's presence on his campaign trail. Mm. That's insane. But uh, that is a very explicit version of what happens by small measure every day in politics, which is um, a, a controlling of the message by virtue of what you're willing, to, or what you're allowed access to, and that access being contingent on the way in which you treat that party. Hmm. How was that road profile received? Because the Monthly was the same magazine that a few years earlier had published an essay that Kevin Rudd wrote for it. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I know that Kevin did not like that piece. <laughs> uh, I know that um, his his horsemen did not like that piece. Um, the there were some in the Labour Party who liked that piece very much. <laughs> uh, readers really liked that piece, and I think that's the only important part of that story mm -hmm. because um, that's who we serve in journalism. Mm -hmm. And whenever we lose um, sight of that fact we lose sight of what we do and that that's that's not me saying that we should have um you know real-time numbers about how many people are reading a story about baby pandas mm. but lots is the answer lots is the answer to that and that's not what i mean by serving our readers i mean <laughs> um if if a story is for anyone but those people who have invested in you um the power of impertinence that is journalism and that that power is invested in you only in your reader by your readership if, if you have no readers you do not have that power and uh, and we should always remember that it is. I you know I have no no special means by which to call myself a journalist. It's only that people read my work that I'm allowed to do so, and um, and it is great license that we get. But um, but we have to respect where that license comes from. Mm -hmm. And you know I'm not a journalist by virtue of the fact that people in power want to talk to me. I'm a journalist by virtue of the fact that people want to read what those other people have told me. Coming towards the end, um, you had about 18 months in the wilderness, is that right? Between uh, leaving the Herald and the... I wouldn't call it the wilderness. That well, was, yeah. that was, quite, that was, that was quite an intensive 18 months of designing a newspaper. That's what I was going to ask. What, putting... what was your life like at that time? Because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Kevin Rudd thing ran then and you did a smaller piece on Christopher Pine. That's true. And not much else journalism during that time. No, um, so th those pieces I did simply because, you know, the, the Pine piece took a day, the Rudd piece took a couple of days or a week, no, a couple of days. Um, they weren't, you know, big investments of time, mm. um, and I do I do really like writing. So if if in my current job I could be writing, 
Um, I mean, I, I do. I write a bit of TV and I write some film stuff, but I don't write any journalism because you can't do journalism in your own time, really. You have to um, you have to fit it around other people's willingness to speak to you, which is not late at night after you've come home from the paper, mm-hmm. and um, and, it's, and it's not at weekends necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, but save for those two little bits of journalism, uh, and and finishing off that Cullen book. Um, my days then they they were they were not as full as my days immediately after the paper launched, but they they were spent taking apart newspapers and putting them back together in different ways and and trying to work out what I wanted the paper to do and how the paper was going to be different to other newspapers and where it was going to find its purpose and who its reader was and um and you know putting together business cases for how it would work in different different scenarios finding you know finding distributors and finding printers and trying different printers and trying different designers mm. um, trying different fields for the paper all of these things that you just would never get the time to do once you actually launch the paper um, was it as fun as you'd hoped it would be that that was stupendously fun because it was it was all all care and no responsibility at that point mm. I wasn't I wasn't losing a single dollar um, I didn't have you know the great uh, sort of um, machinery of a newspaper grinding away behind me. I was I was just in a room with different things stuck on the wall. Um, idealistic, really optimistic. Really thinking, yeah, really being idealistic about newspapers mm. and um, really about audience, about saying, at that point, I was 23, why were people like me not reading newspapers? And the answer was that newspapers had never really spoken to people like me, that there was this whole class of um, increasingly well-educated people under the age of 30 who weren't reading newspapers because newspapers didn't think they should be reading them mm. um, and and it was about being able to find a kind of archetypal reader who who happily you know if I walk through Surrey Hills or Fitzroy um, I, I see that very reader on a Saturday morning reading the paper mm. and it's um, and it's deeply satisfying mm. but um, in you know, in addition to also contacting various journalists, getting getting people ready to be be working on the paper once it launched, um, a lot of that time was simply spent thinking about audience, and um, and I don't know that you get a lot of time to do that in a big newsroom. Um, I like to think that I still still spend a lot of my time thinking about audience, but um, if you know, if as happens in newsrooms, you're you're toiling away at your desk and the editor gets knifed and you get pulled up and you become editor um, you don't necessarily um, get that time to centre your mind before you start doing that job mm. How did you go about hiring writers? Staff writers? Uh, in a Which, fairly haphazard way How many um, do you have? I've got three staff writers yeah. um, and certainly you know, the, I think about two weeks before launch I still didn't have a chief political correspondent um, and I was still thinking hard about how I wanted people who weren't conventional journalists to be writing for this paper, even in our staff positions. Um, although, of course, Mike, Mike Seckham is, is very much a journalist. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And Karen Middleton, who works with us in Canberra, is, she's, she's been in the um, press gallery, I think, for two decades. Um, she's, she is a terrific journalist who is very much a journalist. Martin's a guy I met in a bar literally two weeks before we launched. Martin um, McKenzie Murray. Martin McKenzie Murray, who's our chief political correspondent. Really? And so that's the origin story between that, you two? That is. Wow. Um, and I, ga- I think I gave him the job straight away in the bar. I hadn't seen any of his writing. Um, he was loquacious and um, and interesting and was, was reading exactly the right sort of stuff. He was working as a speechwriter for the... Um, Chief Commissioner of the Victorian Police at that time, which to me was a really interesting thing um, because speech writing is about moral heft and it's about quickly finding empathy. And I could could tell him like Martin, Martin is is a person when you meet him who you see has a great capacity for empathy. And I was beginning at that time to realise that in in a chief correspondent, I didn't necessarily want politics. Or, or news. I wanted someone who was capable of telling other people's stories. Um, and and Martin has politics. I mean, he's 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 worked he's worked in politics as a speechwriter as well. Um, he he understands politics. He understands news. But um, 
his real skill is that skill of a speechwriter and is that that is in the first few moments of a speech um, particularly a speech that's going to be delivered by a police chief who you know he might be addressing as was the case at that time you know, the, the issues of domestic violence and trying to find a means by which to cut through with speeches about that and, and Ken Lay I think really did that and, and Martin drove a lot of that in his time um, working for the cops um, but I you know the reason I gave Martin the job is because I could see that this was a person who wasn't conventionally a journalist who hadn't practiced news journalism per se but who had practiced a kind of writing that was about a sort of intimacy that you don't see in newspapers often enough and I, I think you'd agree that his work is is intimate yeah a great hire like the yeah. fact that you hadn't actually seen his writing before offering yeah. him the job like you must have been blown away when you actually saw how this guy can write because anything he puts uh, to paper is just incredible and worth the price of admission alone I think yeah I will say I, I think um, other other members of the team were a little concerned at my um, late and radical hiring policy <laughs> but it um, it turned out well okay the last thing I want to ask you about is the headlines how mm-hmm. important are the headlines to you in the Saturday paper uh, in print we've made a lot of decisions around both being a conventional newspaper but also being a newspaper that is fused with kind of magazine formats um, and that does things that newspapers don't otherwise do. But the the very core language of newspapers we were keen to be a part of, to make clear when we launched and when we were on newsstands for the first time that we weren't, like, we weren't a, a magazine, we were a newspaper. And um, there's, there's font choices and there's layout choices. You'll... The, the, front page of the paper is far more conventional than any of the inside pages Mm. because we want you to know that you're reading a newspaper um and so one of the things that that i liked historically in newspapers and i should say in that 18 months i spent a lot of time in the microfiche at um at the state library going through old copies of the national times national review um and and papers from overseas and looking at what made them good papers one thing I like and that is deeply silly um, is, you know, a silly part of journalism is, is silly headlines um, and the Saturday paper takes a particular joy in, in silly headlines um, partly because most of them are written quite close to deadline and um, some of them are written probably a little bit tipsy and you can you can actually, some issues, uh, I, I, um, I could be breathalyzed simply by reading the issue, the um the following morning um but uh, yeah another irony of launching a newspaper dedicated to long-form journalism is that in our first year um the only bit of us i think that got nominated for a walkley was the shortest category at the walkley's headlines and uh that tells you about how good our long-form journalism is no it tells you it tells you something about the walkley's the second year luke williams was nominated wasn't he was that even the first uh, was that the first, oh, that that actually sorry look now i'm being cruel yes. um this is this is the solid system of e- editing and the ego of editing that i told you i tried to divorce myself from but uh yes of course the headlines were mine which is why i remember that no luke <laughs> luke's piece also was nominated in the uh short long form category yes and uh and became a book last week yes he was previous guest of penmanship right he spoke highly of you and I'm very glad that I had the chance to talk to you. Thanks for being on the show. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to Penmanship, and thank you to my guest, Eric Jensen. You can find show notes to this episode, including stories that we discussed, at penmanshippodcast.com. You can find the podcast on Twitter, at penmanshipau, and on Facebook. If you have feedback for me, you can email me, andrew at penmanshippodcast.com. If you'd like to support this show, there's a couple of ways you can do so. You can leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to be listening to this podcast. Or you can share it with people in your life who love reading and talking about great Australian writing. The theme song for Penmanship is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. That's all for now. Until next time.